I'm Alberto Ver nice to meet you all um, I teach at the University of Miami I teach how students how to do visualization and infographics and charts maps diagrams etc and this happened I became a became a professor after um, more than a decade uh, working in the in the news industry producing both uh, pictorial explanations of information like uh, graphics that use drawings illustrations and 3d diagrams and animations etc to tell complex stories and also producing data visualizations uh, visual displays of quantitative data intended to uh, illuminate the public about about certain issues what, what i'm showing you on the screen is just a selection of several projects that i did in the past um i also well simon mentioned that already he will probably show you some of the visualizations that we have worked on a in collaboration a, for for a google news lab so my role in that collaboration is simply being the uh, sort of a project manager slash art director so my role is basically to bug designers all the time giving them feedback um, about their work and it's a very enlightening experience and i think that if you see some of the projects that we have done that um it, they can be quite inspiring for for the future for you and now i'm teaching i'm teaching at the university of miami so i teach students how to do this kind of thing uh, both in interactive ways and and also in static ways and i also organize conferences so i'm going to use this opportunity to do a little bit of product placement um, so if you're interested in data journalism data visualization and the many ways that data and digital technologies may be changing society uh, coming up on March the 2nd, that's a month from now, that's a Friday, we have a free conference coming up called Data Intersections. So this is going to be one day of a short talks by six different speakers, a, followed by a conversation between those speakers and the public. Those speakers come from disciplines such as journalism. So we have Shasna Nessa, who is the director of visuals of the Wall Street Journal, uh, Steve Duenes, who is the director of graphics at the New York Times. And then we also have speakers coming from the digital humanities, people coming from data science, people coming from statistics. So we have like six speakers and then, um, so there's going to be the, the talks first and then an opportunity to discuss with them um, a, in the afternoon, right? A great opportunity to meet them. So if you're interested, just follow the link. I have shared all these slides with Simon. So he can share them with you later after after the presentation today. Simon mentioned both the both books that I have written so far for the American market, the functional art and the truthful art. In both of them, I use sort of the same definition for visualization for the work uh, that I do. Right. So I, I define visualization uh, as any sort of representation that is designed to enable the exploration of certain information or data. Uh, analyzing those data somehow and sometimes to communicate the results of your analysis to the general public which is what i why I specialize in right how to communicate with the public using graphs maps diagrams and so on and so forth i will get by the way in a minute to why the title of this talk is visual trumpery because it's really directly related to the contents of the talk right now i'm just giving you a broad introduction to visualization so in concrete, data visualization is based on the idea of visual encoding, right? So if you want to learn how to create good graphics, the first, one of the first things that you need to learn is how to transform those numbers into visual shapes, because that's exactly what we do in data visualization, right? In data visualization, you usually begin with some sort of a spreadsheet or with, or with, a, with a database full of, full of numbers. And what you do in data visualization is to map those numbers proportionally onto properties of objects, right? So the property that you vary according to, your, to those numbers that you're trying to represent could be the length or the height of an object, like in the case of a bar graph, like in bar graphs, we vary the height or the, sh or the, or the length of different bars. It could be the position of different objects, like in a dot plot. It could be the size of different objects, like in bubble charts, like area, right? In that case, we vary the area of those objects in proportion to the numbers that each one of those objects are representing. We can vary the angle, we can vary the line weight of certain objects, we can vary the shade of color of those objects, like in data maps, for example, there's a specific kind of data map called the choropleth map, in which you map the numbers using uh, shades of different color, for example, 
the bigger the number, the darker the color, right? And the opposite is also true, right? So this is the, the core idea in data visualization. And data visualization is becoming mainstream. Perhaps I don't need to even explain this to you that we are seeing visualizations everywhere nowadays, right? Um, we see them in, in social media, we see them in news media, we see them on television, we see them on textbooks, we see visualization in, cl in the classroom all the time. Many scientific disciplines are adopting visualization as a language to explore data and also to communicate those data. And I believe that one of the reasons why visualization is becoming mainstream, which I believe that is a positive phenomenon, is the role of popularizers and promoters, such as, for example, Hans Rosling. So Hans Rosling, if you're interested in communicating with data and doing journalism with data, one of the first people I would look into for inspiration would be Hans Rosling. Hans Rosling was a professor of global health in Sweden. Um, and in 2006, he gave a presentation at the TED Talks, and he became a global celebrity after that talk because of the way he presented very complex data to the public in a very engaging and fun manner. I believe that he's one of he was one of the most inspiring figures in the history of data visualization, and sadly he passed a few months ago. But his son is continuing his work uh, through uh, uh, the website gapminder.org. So I would encourage you to visit gapminder.org and go to the video sections of that website to get some inspiration from popularizers of data visualization, such as Hans Rosling. There is another factor that also explains why visualization is seen everywhere nowadays, which is the role of news media, right? So places such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, ProPublica, and so on and so forth, the Wall Street Journal, Axios, they are using graphs and maps for displaying data more and more these days. And that educates the public to seeing them more often, right? We are used to seeing graphics today. It very rarely, for example, we see stories about the economy or about politics that don't include some sort of visual, and in particular, some sort of graph or map displaying data. On the screen right now, you have several news organizations that I'm very fond of because of the work that they do, both in the United States, those are the ones on top, and also in other countries such as Spain, uh, Germany, and even uh, Ukraine. So these are all news organizations that use visualization on a regular basis and as a result of that they promote the use of data visualization right um data visualization is also winning pulitzer awards so in 2015 the washington post won a pulitzer award thanks to this project uh, which displays how many people died uh, because uh, because of police shootings in the united states throughout that year and the whole project is a data visualization that that shows you every single case then it, 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 it groups the cases according to different categories, right? Male, female, et cetera, according to the weapon, according to the race, and so on and so forth. It also geolocates those, those cases. So it's a, the whole thing is like a, like, like a visual database, right? It's a data visualization. And more locally here in Florida, I'm particularly proud of this project, although I was not involved in this project in any way. So the Tampa Bay Times, which is a much smaller news organization than the Washington Post, also won a Pulitzer Award, uh, thanks mainly to, uh, uh, to data and to visualization, in a project that they call a, a Failure Factories, which is a project that shows you how a specific county close to Tampa, called Pinellas County, or it's actually the, the, the county that contains Tampa, if I'm not wrong, is becoming increasingly, uh, the school district in that area is becoming increasingly racially divided, and as a consequence of that, it's also becoming worse all the indicators are showing that that particular uh, county and its school district is becoming worse in relationship to the racial disparities. So it's a very interesting data-driven project. I'm showing you these just because I know that many of you will want to become journalists and perhaps in particular data journalists in the future. All these projects can be great. Uh, they can be really inspiring and they can help you follow one of the uh, advice, one of the pieces of advice that I give my students a, every semester, which is to get started in any industry or in any business, copy from the best. Copy meaning not plagiarizing anybody, but getting inspiration from the best out there. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Tampa Bay Times, and so on and so forth. Another factor that contributes to the growing popularization of data visualization is that the tools that we use in the industry um, are, easy, are actually easier to use than ever. And in many cases, they are free. And in some specific cases, they are even open source. I'm going to show you the huge variety of tools that I use in my own workflow. 
This is a diagram uh, that displays most of the tools that are used to produce data visualization, right? You can read more uh, when Simon shares these slides with you. If you click on this link down here, that will take you to a series of tutorials, video tutorials that are recorded for my own students at the University of Miami about most of these tools, how to use Illustrator, how to use Insight, how to use Flourish, which is a tool that launched today, and I believe that it is amazing. Uh, so I have recorded tutorials about all these tools. And the difference between today and 20 years ago when I began my career is that today, all these tools are much easier to use than ever. And in many cases, they are uh, free, or at least they have a free version. The only non-free tool that you have right here, if I'm not wrong, is Adobe Illustrator. And well, Excel is also there, right? But the main one that is not free is Adobe Illustrator. All the other ones are either free or free and open source or a combination of any of that, right? Uh, so this is um, this is another another factor that contributes to the promotion and popularization of data visualization. The challenge is though, and here comes the part about why this talk is called trumpery and etc. is related to how careful we need to be whenever we design visualizations and also when we read visualizations that are being shown in the in the media. Because visualization that is not carefully designed can be highly misleading. So it is great that we have all those software tools out there that we can learn and take advantage of, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But we need to be extremely careful with principles of presentations and think critically and very carefully about how we present data to the public. This is the reason, by the way, Simon may mention at some point to you that he's fond of saying that data journalism today is the new punk in the sense that anybody can do it. I agree with that idea. I believe that anybody can do journalism with data, but only only if we master not only the tools of the trade, but also some cert certain principles of the trade as well, such as a critical thinking, statistical thinking, and in the case of visualization, certain principles of data visualization. Let me show you a few graphics that are actually quite misleading. This is a map that hangs on the walls of the White House at the moment. Right? This is a photograph that was taken by a reporter in the White House. And apparently that map was printed out at that size, it was framed, and now it hangs on the walls of the White House somewhere. It's a map, as you can see, that shows the presidential election results in 2016. Red are regions that were won by candidate Trump, and blue are regions in the United States that were won by a candidate Hillary Clinton. Uh, President Trump is very fond of this map. A while ago, uh, a few reporters from Reuters visited uh, President Trump to interview him about his 100, first 100 days in office. And President Trump handed out copies of this map to these reporters. This is a photograph that was taken in the global office during the interview. And those are the three maps that President Trump handed out to the reporters who came visit him. Apparently, he had a stack of these maps on his table, on his desk, and he was uh, giving them away to people who came visit him in, the, in his office, because obviously he's very proud of his victory in 2016, and, and good for him. He won against all odds, right? But what I would say to President Trump and everybody else that uses this map and promotes this map is that this map is highly misleading. This map has been shown also in media that is um, supportive of, of President Trump. These are very several screenshots from places like Breitbart or the Washington Times or whatever, and all of them display the same map, red and blue. And it has also appeared in the cover of books. Right? So this is a, a book written by an author called Jack Posobiec, who is a, a right-winger, very, very supportive of President Trump. As you can see, the title of the book is Citizens for Trump, and then we have the map over there again. Now, I'm very, I'm very open and very, you know, I try to be helpful to people. And whenever I see a map or a chart that doesn't work for some reason, I like to offer my free advice to improve it. And when I saw this cover, this book cover in social media, I actually replied to Posobiec saying, you know, I think that the, your cover, the book cover, the, the cover of your book is a little bit problematic because the title of your book, is not showing, it's not, it's not talking about what the map is showing. The end the map is not showing what the title is saying because the title of the book is Citizens for Trump, but the map is not showing citizens, all right? It's not showing citizens, it's showing something else. So I, I, I said, you know, I thought, well, changing the map may be a little bit difficult because if you want to design a map 
uh, you need to use a specialized software such as GIS or Flourish, this new tool that I mentioned before, etc. So perhaps it is easier instead of changing the map, it is easier to change the title of the book because that title actually says what the map is showing. The map is not showing people, amount of citizens who voted for each one of the candidates. What the map is actually showing is the number of counties and the surface of each one of these counties that voted either for candidate Clinton or that voted for candidate Trump. Let's think about this map critically, right? Let's go back to this map. What is the proportion of red and the proportion of blue, right? The surface covered by each one of these colors. I can tell you this is 80% red and 20% blue, roughly. That's the surface, the total surface, the total area of the red counties and the total surface of the blue counties. But as you all know, one of the stories in the election was that President Trump won in areas that are sparsely populated, but but huge in terms of terrain, right, amount of surface, and candidate Clinton tended to win in counties that are more densely populated and with, with higher populations, right? That's the problem with this map. If you remember the whole idea behind data visualization, data visualization is the proportional representation of numbers. If what you want to represent proportionally is the popular vote, right, the amount of people who voted for each one of the candidates, this map is really bad because it is not true that 80% of people voted for President Trump and 20% of people voted for Hillary Clinton. The popular vote was actually split almost in half. It was 46% versus 48% versus 48% versus around 6% who voted for other candidates. So the split was actually almost 50-50, 46 versus 48. And the original map is showing us 80%, 20%. So it's highly skewed if what you want to show is the popular vote. It gets even worse, by the way, if you take into account the number of eligible voters who didn't vote, which is, was around 40%. That means that the proportions of those two candidates are even smaller. Only one quarter of eligible voters voted for a, a, a President Trump, and close to one third of possible voters voted for candidate Clinton. So this is the main reason that map, when presented alone, is so misleading, because it shows you a landslide victory, when what actually happened was a very, very close victory due to the Electoral College. Now, let me tell you, this country, this country is becoming so polarized and so ideologically divided that it's also becoming divided in, in, in terms of visualization preferences. So I, I follow both uh, Republicans and conservatives and liberals and progressives and Democrats in social media. And I have observed that systematically, <clears throat> Republicans and conservatives love to publish this map and promote this map, the map on the upper left corner. And liberals and progressives usually reply whenever they see that first map on social media, they, they reply with the second map that you have down here. This is a map that shows you the amount of votes that the winning candidate on each one of the counties got in the 2016 presidential election, right? So the bubble size is proportional to the number of votes received just by the candidate who won on each county, right? So this is a little bit better if what you want to represent is popular vote, right? You immediately see that blue areas, blue bubbles tend to be bigger than red bubbles. But when you aggregate them together, it's almost a 50-50 split, right? Now, the, this map is also problematic. One of the challenges that I see is that I believe that both conservatives and progressives or, or liberals that I follow in social media are wrong. Neither of these maps is good. The second map is also bad, or, or at least it's not completely good, because it is only showing you who won on each area. And that avoids or ignores or conceals the fact that there are plenty of Republican votes in Democratic candidates and plenty of Democratic votes in Repu sorry in, re in Republican counties, right? So it's like we are showing only Democratic votes in Democratic areas and Republican votes in Republican areas, right? And we are ignoring tons of people. So something that may be a little bit better if what you care about is showing the a, a, the popular vote will be to do two different maps of the of the popular vote, one for amount of votes for the Republican candidate and another one for the amount of votes received by the Democratic candidate. But again, I don't think that any of these graphics is that helpful. None of these graphics is that helpful. Why are they are not that helpful? Because if what you win, if you what you really want to do is to uh, show how how proud you are of your own victory in a presidential election, none of these maps is appropriate for that. Because what really counts, what really matters, 
to win a presidential election in the United States is none of these graphics, is not displayed on any of these graphics. What you really, really need to focus on first and foremost is the amount of electoral votes that you got in the election. So if I were elected president of the United States, which is completely impossible because I was not born in the United States, the graphic that I will frame and hang on the walls of the White House would be similar to this one, right? So some sort of graph that shows you the split. Actually, this is I need to correct this because there were like six electors, electors who voted for other candidates. So I need to put them over here. So I believe that the final numbers were 304 for Trump and 227 for Clinton, with a few votes here that went to other candidates that were not even in the election. There was one elector who voted for the bald eagle, if I'm not wrong. Anyway, and then two maps that show you the results of the presidential elections at the national level, state by state, and then some sort of map, all right, this is called a cartogram in the literature of data visualization. There's a free tool, by the way, that Simon can speak about in class to design these kinds of graphics. It's called Tilegrams, all right? So it's a very, very, very good tool. It's the one that I use to create this kind of map. This map over here distorts the areas of each one of the states over here in proportion to the number of electoral votes that they contribute to the presidential election. So this is the map that I will hang on the walls of the White House. None of the previous ones tell you the first thing that you need to know about the presidential elections. They are not, for that reason, they are not bad maps. They are just inappropriate if what you want to talk about is your victory in the presidential election. So cases like these and some others that I'm going to show you have led me to believe that people in general may not be reading graphics that well, or at least not everybody is able to read data visualization perfectly well. These are the questions that I like to pose to myself, uh, that, I have, that I have posed to myself in the past few months or past years, is do people understand the grammar, that grammar that has been used in graphics? Are they able to decode the graphic, the vocabulary of graphics, right? Meaning the scales that we use, or do they understand it? What is an X axis? What is a Y axis, etc. And among the people who can read graphics, the grammar of graphics correctly, do they interpret these graphics, the messages that these graphics contain correctly? This is a key question. One of the things that I tell my students is that what you design is not exactly what people end up seeing, right? And we need to be careful, for example, labeling our graphics very, very accurately, as accurately as possible to avoid ambiguity, right, in the impossible interpretations of our graphics. There is another piece of, of information, by the way, of evidence that has led me to believe that not everybody can read even the simplest kinds of graphics correctly. Back in 2014, for example, the Pew Research Center conducted a study in which they asked a sample of a thousand people, what do you see in this graphic, right? This is a, a very simple scatter plot. So each one of these dots represents a country. The position of each one of these dots on the x-axis is proportional to the average sugar consumption per country. And then the position on the y-axis is proportional to the average number of decayed teeth per person on each one of these countries. So you immediately see that there is a positive relationship. The more sugar people consume on average, the larger the number of average of decayed teeth that you have in, on that country. Well, unfortunately, only 63% of the sample, 1,000 people, <clears throat> surveyed by the Pew Research Center were able to decode this graphic correctly. The other 37% were not able to read this graphic correctly or they extracted the wrong message. They saw other things, right? So this is problematic for different reasons. One of them is that the, the scatter plot is not a novel graphic form. It's not a graphic that has been invented five years ago. The scatter plot has been around for more than 100 years. The first scatter plots were designed in the middle of the 19th century by statisticians such as Sir Francis Galton, who used graphics like that to show you to show the correlation between, for example, the height of people and the, and the head size of, of those people as well. There's a relationship, right? The taller you are, the bigger your head tends to be, right? All right, so this graphic kind of graphic has been around for very, very long. But still, we have around one-third of the population who's not able to decode even, even this simple graphic. So, all this problem led me to believe that we may be facing a crisis in graphicacy. What is graphicacy? Graphicacy is visual literacy, right? The ability of to decode visual messages. And more in concrete, for the purposes of this talk, the ability to decode 
charts and maps and diagrams and data visualizations and infographics and so on. So uh, in the past in the past year or year and a half, I decided to put together a series of recommendations for people uh, on how to become better readers as an, uh, of charts and as an extension of that, how to become better designers of those same charts, right? which may be useful for you in the future. But I decided not to title the talk Graphicacy because Graphicacy sounds a little bit too scientific or a little bit geeky or, or um, a little bit boring even. So, I, and I wanted to attract you know, big, big audiences. I'm making a series of public lectures um, a, all over the United States with this same content. And I decided to talk, title the talk differently just because graphic is sound, graphic is sounded so boring. And after I was looking for a title and after the 2016 presidential election, someone on my Twitter stream uh, tweeted the meaning of the English word trumpery. And when I saw the meaning of that word, I thought that it was absolutely wonderful uh, to use in a talk like this because trumpery specifically means something that deceives and more specifically, something that deceives the eye, which is exactly what bad charts, dubious charts do. They deceive the eye. They are trumperies, right? So I decided to title the talk Visual Trumpery, first of all, because it was such a perfect word. Also, because it would help me attract bigger audiences than graphicacy, which sounds so boring. And also because it would help me make the first point or give the first, um, offer the, explain the first rule of becoming better readers of charts and maps, which is to pay attention and always read beyond the title. Because if you don't pay attention and you don't read beyond the title of a chart, it will be more likely than not that you will be misled by the contents of that chart. And after you have read the chart attentively, that you have paid attention to the, how the chart is structured and, what, and the data that is displayed, there are five different things that you can do or that you can pay attention at, right? There are like five different rules or things that to look for in any chart. The first one is, is the designer using the right data and disclosing the origins of those data? So you are all journalists, so you know how important it is to credit your sources. But it is also important to verify your sources because otherwise you may, uh, it's important, let me rephrase that, not to just you know find a random data set from a reputable source, download the data set and just use it right away. It is very important to take a look at the methodology that was used to generate those data, because otherwise you will make mistakes all the time. All right? I have made these kinds of mistakes myself plenty of times. All right? So let me show you a, an example. A Vox.com, which is a media organization that I like and I admire and I follow, I, but they make mistakes like everybody else, like, like myself, for, for example. A while ago, they published the following story. America's healthcare prices are out of control these 11 charts prove it. Well, this is a, first of all, this is a clickbaity headline, and it's also highly misleading because no charts never prove anything on their own. That's the first thing. And they never show you everything you possibly want to know about a particular topic, right? But the problem in this story were, were a, the charts, but and also the source of those charts. So when I saw this story, this story is made of 11 graphs, like the one that you have on the screen right now, right? This one. This particular one among the 11 is showing you a comparison of the price of cataract surgeries in different countries, the United States, Spain, and so on and so forth. I am originally from Spain, and when I saw these charts, this one and the others, uh, uh, so, some sort of a, an alarm started ringing inside my brain because I saw that in Spain, prices of a cataract surgery are half of what they are in the United States. But I also remember that um, the disposable income of both countries it's also half in, the, in Spain than what it is in the United States. So the first question that I had about this story is whether these prices were adjusted by purchasing power parity. $1,000 is a lot of money in Spain. It is also quite a lot of money in the United States, but $1,000 will take you a long way in Spain. They will not take you a long way in the United States because people there make smaller salaries. Doctors make less money and the disposable income that the average person in both countries, as you can see, is double of what it is in Spain. But this is not the reason why this story, I believe, is wrong, or at least it should not have been published under its current form. The problem is the source. The source is credited in the story, good for Vox, that's very good practice. 
So you could go directly to the source, which is something that we should always do, right? When, when, when we have time, obviously. If you go to the source, the source is an organization called the International Federation of Health Plans. And the data has a methodolo methodology page. How was the data generated? How it was created? And there are several red flags in this methodology page. The first one is that the data was not run, the, the sample that was used to generate the data was not randomly selected. That's the first red flag. The methodology page says that the prices, uh, those average prices per country, were calculated by uh, a prices submitted by participating, participating federation member plans. That means that they calculated those country averages based on the prices reported by health plans that belong to this organization alone. But we don't know if those are representative of the entirety of each one of those countries. This is not the only problematic part. Here comes the worst part. So the first thing is that how were prices calculated for the United States? Well, this looks fine to me because they gathered hundreds of millions of data points from the United States. They gather prices charged by organizations in the United States, healthcare plans. They averaged those hundreds of millions of reports, and they came out with the average price of a cataract surgery in the United States, the average price of a night, of a night in, in a hospital, in the United States, all those average were based on millions of medical claims, right? So when you have millions of data points, if you calculate the average, it's more likely than not that that average will be similar to the actual real average in the real world. But let's take a look at how averages were calculated for all the other countries that are displayed in the data and also in the charts published by Vox.com. Here comes the problematic part. Prices for other countries were calculated based on the prices charged by one private health plan on each country. Now, this is highly problematic. Why? Because you cannot assume that that specific healthcare plan that you chose to represent the country actually is representative of prices charged by all the other providers in that country. It may be that that single provider in that country is either much more expensive than the average, much less expensive than the average, or is close than the average. You don't really know. Well, to add insult to injury, the source itself, right, this source itself tells you indirectly, please don't use these data, right? So if you go to the end of the page, it says comparisons across different countries are complicated by different factors. And single plans prices may not be representative of prices paid by other plans in that market. See, this is a huge red flag. It's basically telling you don't download this data and use it directly. Verify it first. So this is what happens when we mindlessly download data from any source, even reputable sources such as this one, and use it directly without verifying it somehow. And again, this is a, a, this is a, a, a challenge or a problem or a mistake that I have made myself. Now I know a little bit better, right? But I keep making mistakes all the time. The second point in becoming better readers or better designers of charts is uh, making sure that you are not reading too much into the graphic. And we do this all the time. Let me show you an example. A while ago, several media organizations published stories with titles such as um, Correlation Between Countries' Chocolate Consumption and Nobel Prize Winners. Eating chocolate may help you win the Nobel Prize. A study links a country's chocolate intake to how many Nobel Prize winners it spawns. Eat chocolate, win the Nobel Prize, right? Yeah, sure, right? So where did all, crap, did all this crap came from? Well, it came from a very reputable source, reputable source. So the source for all these stories was the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very, very reliable source, right? The New England Journal of Medicine published a column. It was not even a study. It was just a column, very conjectural column, by a cardiologist in New York who, according to an interview I read with him, one day was bored in a, he was very bored. He was attending a conference and he was very bored in his hotel room. And he decided to download data of chocolate consumption and data of number of Nobel prizes through the data into a charting tool, perhaps Excel. And he discovered that there is a very strong relationship between chocolate consumption per person per country and the number of, number of Nobel prizes 
that you have on each one of these countries. And this is the chart that he generated, right? So you have all the countries, then the position on the x-axis is chocolate consumption per capita, and then the position on the y-axis is, is the number of Nobel Prizes per 10 million people. And as you can see, well, there's a relationship, right? The more chocolate you consume, a country consumes on average, the more the, or the bigger the number of Nobel Prizes those countries have. Now, this article was just a conjecture. It was not a study, right? It was just an observation, a quick observation. And this guy threw some conjectures as, as why we may see this kind of relationship. He said, for example, that in the article that we know that chocolate um, improves cognitive function in the short term. So if you eat a little bit of chocolate before attending class, you will be more attentive. The sugar and other, and other uh, chemical compounds inside chocolate improve cognitive performance in the short term. But there is a huge leap between saying that and saying that if you eat more chocolate, you will win more Nobel, will win more Nobel Prizes, right? And also the article was written sort of tongue in cheek. So the article at the end, for example, said, Dr. Messerly, the author of the article, reports regular daily chocolate consumption, mostly but not exclusively in the form of Lindt's dark variety. So the article was sort of a half of a joke, right? Now, other people took, but uh, by the way, I thought, I think that the author of the article who designed this chart and started, started making up stories based on this chart was being, was seeing too much, was reading too much into this chart because there may be other many factors that contribute to this relationship between chocolate consumption and number of Nobel Prizes, right? Which is something that was highlighted by an article published in the Journal of Nutrition, tried to debunk the original column written by Dr. Messerly. This was published by the Journal of Nutrition. The title says, Does Chocolate Consumption Really Boost Nobel Award Chances? The Peril of Overinterpreting Correlations in Health Studies. And the point that this article makes is that you can correlate Nobel Prizes with many other things, such as, for example, wealth. The wealthier a country is, the more Nobel Prizes it has, just because we do have more money to invest in education. And some people will be outliers, they will become extremely smart, and they will win the Nobel Prize. Right? So if you, if you see there is a very strong relationship between gross domestic product and number of Nobel Prizes. But you can, you can correlate number of Nobel Prizes with many other things. And these people are starting becoming a little bit playful. They say, for example, there is a relationship, and quite, quite strong for that matter, between wine consumption per capita and number of Nobel Prizes. That doesn't mean that getting drunk will make you win the Nobel Prize. And they also calculated the relationship between number of IKEA stores and number of Nobel Prizes. And the relationship is actually stronger than it is between chocolate consumption and number of Nobel Prizes. So we need to be really, really careful into, uh, with not reading too much into the charts that are being presented to us, and being careful with that. Now, the other thing is, is data represented accurately? That's the other thing. Remember that the whole idea behind data visualization is the proportional representation of the numbers. Let me show you a chart here. This is a chart that was used in Congress to attack Planned Parenthood, to try to cut funding for Planned Parenthood. Now, I don't really care what you think about Planned Parenthood. I don't care if you are in favor of it or against it. What we should be all against it against is, um, a, a, is bad charts. And this is a very bad chart. Take a look at what it's showing. This was used by Republican representatives. I believe that it was a representative, Jason Chaffetz from Utah, who used this chart to attack Planned Parenthood, saying that Planned Parenthood is conducting much fewer uh, cancer screening procedures, but the number of abortions that they conduct is also increasing very, very sharply. And as you can see, the two lines vary at the same rate, right? So this goes down very dramatically. This one goes up very dramatically until you read the numbers that are being represented, represented. And you notice that these numbers goes from 2 million down to 1 million. So certainly this is a very dramatic drop, all right? But this one doesn't, doesn't increase at the same rate because the number of abortion has gone from 300,000 up to 320,000 or 330,000. So they don't vary at the same rate. This is highly misleading because whoever designed this chart was using two different scales, one scale for the first line and another scale for the second line. When you put the two lines on the same scale, this is something that Vox.com did, right? <clears throat> you will see that they look very different. It's certainly true that the number of cancer screening procedures is going down, but the number of abortions has stayed very basically flat. But probably when you take population increase into account, this line will become flatter just because the population in 2013 is much bigger than it was in 2006, right? And moreover, 
This graphic is problematic also for another reason, because it conceals important information. A Planned Parenthood does many other things other than abortions and cancer screening procedures. They also do STD testing. They also do contraception. They also do pregnancy and prenatal services. So designer Emily should design this, this chart that shows all the, all the main uh, things that Planned Parenthood does. So regardless of whether you want to defend Planned Parenthood or you want to attack Planned Parenthood, this is the chart that you need to use. This is the truthful chart. This is a complete damn lie, just because the data is not represented proportionally, and second of all, because it is not showing an enough amount of information, right? Which leads me to the next point. Is the graphic showing an appropriate amount of data? This is a great example. This is not showing an appropriate amount of data. This is showing an appropriate amount of data. Now we can have a, now we have, we can have a discussion, right? an informed discussion not a partisan discussion, but an actual rational discussion about the issues, right? And about our values. Now, is a graphic showing an appropriate amount of data, right? In many cases, we don't show an appropriate amount of data. And this is something that we journalists are to blame for in many different cases, just because we journalists are often trained to think about simplification, right? Let's simplify the information. Readers don't care about all this complexity. Let's reduce the amount of information that we show them. Let's show just a couple of numbers, right? The variation between one year and another year. Well, sometimes a couple of numbers capture the reality of a data set well. But more often than not, a couple of numbers are not enough to understand a story. You will need to show more nuance. You will need to include more data. You will need to compare some things to other things. Let me show you an example. This chart, I show it on Twitter one day, it shows the average unemployment rate on the first 100 days of each one of these presidencies, right? Under President Trump is 4.5, under President Obama is what? It was 9, under President Bush it was 4%, President Clinton was 7%. Now, this chart is a simplification, but it is not a clarification, which is what we should care about. We journalists, our job is not to simplify information for readers. It is to clarify information for readers. And in order to clarify, sometimes you need to reduce the amount of information that you show, but more often than not, you need to increase the amount of information that you show and the amount of explanations that you provide. Because if you simplify it this way, you are, for example, obscuring the fact that the, un the average unemployment rate on the first 100 days of each one of these presidencies is largely what each guy inherited from the previous guy, right? So instead of showing just this number, it is better to show, for example, the unemployment rate on the first day of each presidency and on the last day of each one of these presidencies, and then showing the percent difference, so the percent point difference, right, between the beginning and the end of each one of these presidencies. This is a clarification. This is a simplification. Okay, and then <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves: Is uncertainty relevant? And if uncertainty is relevant, and very often it is very relevant, we need to show it. We need to reveal it, right? We need to display it. Let me show you what happens when you, when you, when you don't show in a news story, when you don't show uncertainty that is essential to understanding a story. Back in 2014, El País, which is the most influential national newspaper in Spain, where I am from, published the following headline. Catalan public opinion swings toward no for independence, says survey. A little bit of background. You probably heard what, ha what is going on in Catalonia, in Spain, the region of Catalonia. Uh, a portion of the population of Catalonia wants Catalonia to become an independent country, and another portion of the population wants Catalonia to remain a region of Spain, right? And there is an ongoing debate about that. The regional government in Catalonia every year conduct a survey, right? Asking people their, about their opinions about different things, not only politics, but also culture and stuff. One of the questions that they ask is, do you want Catalonia to become an independent country? That's, the, that's where the data came from, right? Now, this was published in 2014, by the way, three years, four, almost four years ago. So, uh, as you can see, and, and by the way, the headline in Spanish watch must, watch, uh, watch, uh, was much more straightforward. It said, the no to independence in Catalonia is bigger than the yes to independence in Catalonia. 
Is that true? Well, let's take a look at the story. The story said, well, uh, for the first time, you know, for the first time in a while, a majority in the region of Catalonia would reject secession if a referendum were held now. And the the story contained a graphic. The original one was a pie chart. I, I redesigned it as a bar graph just to just for you to see the differences between the no and the yes. And according to this graph, as you can see, it seems to be true that the no to independence, the percentage of people who said no to independence in that survey is bigger than the amount of people, the percentage of people who said yes to independence, right? So no to independence, that's 45.3% of people, which is slightly bigger than the amount of people who said yes to independence, which is 44.5%. And then we have 10% of people who are over here and who don't have an opinion. Now, this story is really bad, particularly the headline of the story. The headline of the story is completely wrong. And let me tell you why. The journalist who who wrote this story himself discloses why this is completely wrong. And in one portion of the story, the reporter who wrote the story says, the margin of error of the poll is three points, a relevant fact considering the tight difference between yes and no to independence in Catalonia. Well, of course it is relevant. It is so relevant that you cannot say that the yes is bigger than the no or that the no is bigger than the yes. All that you can say is that the difference is so small and the margin of error around all these these two point estimates, these are called point estimates in data, right? In statistics, point estimates. So the level of uncertainty around these point estimates, which could be slightly bigger or slightly smaller, is so large and so much bigger than the difference between the data points that all that you can say in your headline, and that will be the appropriate headline to write, is that it seems that there is an equal amount of people who say no to independence to the amount equal to the amount of people who say yes to independence. The no and the yes are tied. That's what the headline should have said, right? Not that the, the, the no is bigger than the yes. We journalists make this mistake all the time. Why do we do this? Because we tend to believe, and we are wrong, that data are precise, that data are accurate. When and, and graphics can be a little bit misleading because of that, because they are so clear cut, right? Their their edges are so sharp and so accurate. Well, we need to educate ourselves to whenever we see a graphic that looks so clear cut and sharp, we need to educate ourselves to see something that is fuzzier, right? Like these, representing the amount of uncertainty around those point estimates provided by the people who created the survey. So I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to give you, just leave these ideas on the table. I hope that they have been, they uh, will be helpful for you in the future as both as readers, uh, critical readers of data visualization, and also perhaps some of you will decide to pursue a career in news visualization and news graphics. And I can assure you that these are rules that took me almost two decades to internalize. And it took me many mistakes that I have made in the past um, to come up with these rules that right now I try to apply uh, to my own work to the extent of my abilities. Sometimes I still fail, obviously, but I try to stick to them as much as possible. And with that, I'm going to close the talk today. And um, I'm I'm open to questions. I, I have like 10 minutes for questions if you have any. Thank you, Alberto. That's fab. Thank you. Cool. So uh, we've got a bit of time for questions. Does anybody that we don't have come yet show show me in Dragon? Oh, good news. Um, what's your favorite project you ever worked on? My favorite project that I have worked on. So there are there are a couple of them, and they are both, I believe, displayed on one of the first slides. I believe that it's the second slide in the uh, in the presentation. So I'm very proud of the work that my team and I at El Mundo did back in 2004. On March uh, 2004, there was a terrorist attack in Madrid, and we did a breaking news animation explaining uh, uh, where the bombs went off, how many people had died, or what uh, several train stations were attacked by terrorists. So we did a visual reconstruction of the of the terrorist attacks using different kinds of software tools. We did a lot of reporting to put that piece together. That was an, an early example of how powerful interactive uh, graphics can be. So I'm still proud of that piece. I think that that piece stands uh, the test of time. It still looks, looks good today, which is something that I cannot say about 99% of what I have done. But that one does. And then 
perhaps a few of the graphics that I produced later when I moved to Brazil between 2010 and 2012. I worked in Brazil for quite a while and I produced several data visualizations. Uh, one of them about a, a population patterns, change in, in population in Brazil. That one is also displayed on the, on the slide that I, in the second slide on the slide deck. And I think that that, that graphic is, it has several problems. For example, the color palette is not great, right? It's a red green color palette, which can be problematic with a uh, colorblind people. So the color palette is not great. But the structure of the graphic, I believe, also is, I believe, is a good example of, of principles that I try to teach in my classes or about how to build narratives with data, how to create a story based on data, and how important it is not only to design your graphics, but also write the headlines and the intros and the explainers to your own graphics, trying to integrate seamlessly the visual part of the graphic and the textual part of the graphic. Both of them are equally important. Oh, and now I'm, I'm just to yeah, and more product placement. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of a, of this collaboration that we are having with the Google News Lab, in particular, um, the about the tools that we are helping develop and fund and, and also release, such as Tilegrams that I mentioned before, or Flourish. I'm very excited about Flourish. Uh, you will notice that if you take a look at the tutorials that are recorded about it, uh, you will notice how enthusiastic I sound about the tool because I believe that it, it will give you know, tons of people who are not necessarily programmers, um, um, superpowers, the capacity of creating a very complex interactive graphics with no code whatsoever. The tool itself generates the JavaScript code and the HTML code in the code in the background. It is still useful to become a coder. So it's important to learn JavaScript and HTML and CSS, et cetera, and D3. So I would encourage you to learn all those, obviously. But many people don't have the time or don't have the skills or don't have the, I don't know, the, 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 I don't know, the, the mind frame, frame of mind to learn coding, right? But they still need to produce interactive maps and interactive charts and tools like Flourish can really help them. So I'm really interested in democratizing data visualization. I believe that all these tools are, are another step in that direction. Yeah. All right. So there is um, um has been always an ongoing debate about whether digital technologies, beginning with the with the internet itself and the web, World Wide Web, and now social media, are actually encouraging people to produce more bad stuff than more good stuff. I believe that we have more of both. Uh, there is actually a a, um, a rule or a, or a law uh, that was uh, formalized by a science fiction writer called Theodore Stur Sturgeon. A many years ago, who said once, 90% of everything is crap, or 90% of everything is shit, right? So now, nowadays, we're facing a situation in, in which we have man, many more visualizations than we used to, uh, many more visualizations in social media and in, in news media, etc. There are many more who are bad, but there are also many more who are good, right? So, and we can help promote the good ones and try to correct or critique the dubious ones, right? So, on one hand, I am excited about the the role of social media. I think that I think that social media can be a very helpful tool for journalists. I use it all the time. I'm on Twitter, and I use Twitter as a as a as a as a tool for work. So I use it to follow people who I admire, see what they are up to, you know, a favorite the things that I like, and then sometimes reply to graphics that I could be, I believe that could be improved somehow. Give my free recommendations. Um, by the way, I'm never insulted if if people don't take my my advice or whatever just because it's just an opinion. Perhaps it's, a, it's an informed opinion because I have been in this business for 20 years, but it's still an opinion, right? So, and, and I believe that we can all contribute to this conversation, right? To this di dialogue about, you know, doing better visualizations, right? Now, <clears throat> in, in, uh, social media also poses a challenge, which is that, and it's related to these difference that I made before between um, a simplification and clarification. Many of the images that we see on social media are images in the sense of graph of charts, okay? data maps, data charts, etc. Um, they cannot, they often cannot uh, embody the entire truth of the data sets that they are representing. They are, they are just the trailer, right? They are just a glimpse into what you will see later if you click on the link. The problem is that many people don't click on links. They just take a look at the at the chart that you have put on your tweet, and they don't click on the link, so they end up not reading 
the entire visualization, right? And they, they may be misled by what they see in on the tweet, but they something that they could avoid if they visit the actual visualization. So how to solve that problem? I don't have a particular answer to that. Perhaps designing graphics for social media that are a little bit more rich in terms of the amount of information that they show, but also educate people and encourage people to actually read things before talking about them or, or before sharing them, right? So instead of sharing a visualization based on what you see on the image posted on Twitter, first of all, take the time to take to go to the link, take a look at the actual visualization, a, verify whether the visualization looks um, uh, dubious or it looks reliable, and then you can share it in social media, right? You got another one. Yeah. Um, okay. So you shared that statistic about how, well, like a third of the people in the Pew Research study couldn't inter properly interpret like a simple scatter plot. So like, what can a journalist do to make even from like a simple to a more complex visualization? Uh, like, like what, what, what can a journalist do to help people understand? We are explainers. Explain it. So. I, throughout my career, I have faced the, the following situation. I tried, for example, to design a scatter plot, and then I have uh, an editor come to me saying, oh, this visualization is so complex, it has so many numbers, let's simplify, let's put just two numbers, and that's it. Because readers are not, readers don't care about numbers, they will not read it, they will, they will not understand how to read this graphic, it's too much work. Now, that reaction is the wrong reaction, because it's a self-defeating reaction. First of all, you're not considering that your readers are, are more often than not much smarter than you are. That's the first thing. Readers are smart, and we need to, we need to consider them as smart people. That, and second of all, we also need to consider that if a person is reading that story, it's because that person is interested in the story. So we need to assume that they are going to take a look at the story, right? And third of all, people can learn. That's the other thing. So the first time that we see any sort of visualization, we don't know how to read that visualization. We just believe, for example, that bar charts, line charts, and pie charts are so intuitive because we have been seeing them since we were six years old or five years old or something like that, right? And someone in elementary school explained to us how to read a bar graph. I, I witnessed that recently with my six-year-old. I mean, her teacher at elementary school is teaching them how to read a histogram and how to read a bar graph and how to read a line chart. So people need to be taught how to interpret the grammar and the vocabulary of graphics. A bar charts, line charts, and pie charts, by the way, they, they had a point of origin. They were invented at some point in history, around the 18th century. One of the earlier uh, promoters of data visualization was a guy called William Playfair. You can look for him in Google, but William Playfair. Uh, Playfair wrote a book called The Commercial and Political Atlas, which was the first book that used systematically line charts, bar graphs, and pie charts. And in the book, Playfair puts those charts in there, charts that today we can read almost intuitively, but he spent a lot of words on the, in the book explaining how to read those charts. So he verbally described how to read a line chart, right? So we could do something similar when we use, for example, a novel graphic form. You believe, for example, that a scatter plot is the best way to display a story. Don't refrain from using the scatter plot. Use it. But then put a caption in there verbalizing how to read the scatter plot and what the main takeaways of that particular scatter plot are. That will accomplish two different goals. First of all, you will have more people being informed. People will interpret things more correctly and they will walk away from your story being more informed. And second of all, you will be also doing some public service. You will be educating people. You will be increasing the amount of graphicacy, visual literacy that those people have. And I believe that we journalists have that responsibility as well.